The fine art of giant killing. How many of you need a giant killed in your life somewhere, somehow, something that's bigger than you are, a challenge that is well beyond your ability? I want to take us back to the story of David and Goliath in the Scripture. The record the Scripture gives us is so clear and so concise. And I want us to look at those two verses, chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, verses 48 and 49. We can reference the entire chapter, but this is really the essence of the story. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. David had killed the lion and the bear, but suddenly he becomes, for all time, known as a giant killer. These two verses capture the essence of the confrontation. David meets Goliath, the shepherd versus the warrior, the little guy versus the overlord, and the, and the little guy wins. Now, This is one of the best-known Bible stories. And yet, for many, it doesn't connect. For many, it's just a, for many, it's, it's just a, a biblical sideline. It's, for some, it's just a, a fanciful story. For, for some, they, they just can't find a place where they really connect. I mean, after all, they can't cast themselves as Goliath. There just aren't too many giants out there. And we cannot cast ourselves as David. Because more often than not, we don't engage the enemy. We avoid him. And so for the most part, we stand like Saul's army in ranks on a hillside watching Goliath come out every day, insult God, threaten plunder, threaten us. We live with this thing out on the horizon that needs to be dealt with, but it's not dealt with. Because it's too big and it's too hard. It's, it's too much. Oh, we hate Goliath. We hate that thing out there. We hate that monster. We talk about how strong he is and how unfair it is and how the world would be a much better place without Goliath. We, we all want to see ourselves as, as David's, but really, Goliath is rarely engaged. Now, here's the, here's the takeaway. You, you can't be a giant killer unless you kill a giant. You can't find that place of power in God until you exercise by faith the power that God gives only in the moment. It would be nice if giants would just fade away, but they don't. You ignore a giant, a giant will just stand there. Children of Israel could have all turned their back on Goliath, and Goliath was going to come out every day. And you remember in the Scripture it tells us that Goliath came out every day for 40 days. Comes out and plays the same scene over and over again, insulting God, insulting the people of Israel, issuing the challenge. Goliaths don't go away even when you ignore them. The good news in all of this is that God will give you victory over Goliath. He will. But you don't just wake up one morning and take down the big boy. There are a few things that you need to know. And as I've spent time in in the text this week, it became so obvious for me that There are some distractions and some stumbling blocks and some problem areas along the way that keep us from that place of victory where we overcome the obstacle that is so much bigger than we are. And I want to speak to them for a few moments. So from this text in 1 Samuel, I want to offer a short tutorial in giant killing. 
Now, a little bit of background that will help set the stage. We go all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 14. And in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we see kind of the tortured life and leadership development of Saul. Saul starts so well, but he's off track almost immediately. Two major blunders leave him in a place where Samuel the prophet turns his back on him and says, I'm done with you. God's done with you. You're going to continue on, but your kingdom will not endure forever. God would have established it forever, but because of what you've done, it will not endure forever. And so Saul is done almost before he has begun. And so what do you do when the door's been slammed hard? What do you do when it looks like all of your support's been withdrawn? Well, you compensate or you overcompensate. You try and win Get some wins under your belt. You try and prove yourself. And we see in Saul, he pours himself into being a warrior. A warrior. And because God is at work delivering the children of Israel, because it's not just about Saul, it's about the people of Israel, when Saul goes to war against God's enemies, God gives Saul victory, even though Saul is out of divine approval. And we're given a listing in 1 Samuel 14, starting in 47, when Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all the enemies on every side, against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he routed them. It's a summary statement on Saul's warrior prowess. Wherever he turned, he routed them. Saul was a winner in battle. Saul was victorious when he picked up the sword. God has created us highly adaptable beings. He gave us the ability to learn and to build on our successes. He designed the human body with muscle memory. Dave and I rode 100 miles in training on Friday and 80 miles yesterday and Every mile, you're shifting gears. I'd never think any more about what gear I'm in or shifting gears or which sprocket I'm in in the front or in the rear cassette. When you're riding, it all just... Ha Have you got anything like that you do in life? It's muscle memory. For a lot of you, it's driving a car. You don't stop to think about how hard you feel it. And you're so used to doing that. You, there are habits. You get in the car and you don't even need to look. You can take the key without even looking. You sit down and you can plug the key straight into the ignition without even looking because you have done it so many times. You get a new car, it messes you up because you've got to find the ignition. You're driving down the road trying to fly. You're trying to find the wipers or you're trying to find the lights because everything has been moved. But your muscle memory tells you in the car that you were used to, your muscle memory tells you where everything is, and so you automatically just go there. You connect there. It doesn't matter whether you're shifting gears or driving down the road or operating a computer. The body records what you're doing and what you do habitually. It, it keeps notes on all of these things, and before long, it happens. It just happens by memory, we say, instinct. He designed our brains to memorize processes. By the way, I don't, don't want to get off, off track too far. But by the way, that's one of the reasons that, that pornography is such a powerful, powerful tool in the destruction of the human soul. Pornography will, it literally etches, it, it etches these neural connections and, and memories in, in a very vivid way, in a, especially in a man's mind. It, it etches these things, and once they have begun to engage in pornography, before long they find themselves trapped habitually in pornography, and it is it's an incredibly powerful and binding tool that the, that the enemy is using specifically against men in these days because it so works on process. I've talked with guys who are really, who are really bound, heavily bound, 
pornography and they'll tell you pastor i know all of the things you can tell me i know the scriptures i know i'm dishonoring my wife i know i'm sinning before god i know this is destroying me i know but i cannot seem to stop myself once my mind begins to go down those roads the bottom line is your mind will memorize the patterns and the processes that you that you engage in over and over and over again and it's difficult to break those patterns especially especially when there's a heavy load of sin involved and the will of the adversary to put you in bondage to those things. We're highly adaptable and our brain memorizes processes and habits and we unconsciously remember and act at times. We're kind of like migratory birds on a pre-programmed course. Is there anyone else here with me who will admit that you've driven home before and don't remember a single thing that you saw? Have you ever got in the car and driven, because your mind, you got in the car and, and you were gone and before you realized, where am I going? I jumped in the car on, um, I don't remember what morning it was this week, but my brain was on fire. I was, I was thinking, I'm sure they were important things. I know that they had to be. And so I had to be. Backed out of the driveway and I got to the end of our street and was about to turn left on Wendover Avenue when I realized that I didn't have my wife. She was at the house, and I remembered, all of a sudden, I remembered quite clearly her saying, I'm coming down. And I stepped out, and I thought, I'm going to, you know, I'll get the car warmed up. And I got the car warmed up, put it in reverse, backed into the road. I'm down the, I'm down the road. I wanted to tell you because I didn't want you to hear it secondhand. Anyway, um, anyways, um, have, you, have you ever been there, done that? Man, you know... At times, I have found, I've found myself like halfway home and I've woke, I've just, it's like I've woken up. Say, what, where was my mind? I know I stopped at stoplights and changed lanes and, and maintained, I know I did all of those things. What's happening? The, the incredible adaptability that God has built into us is a wonderful strength. It can also be a devastating weakness depending on which processes we engage in. What we embrace will ultimately control us almost as though we were on autopilot. And you get used to stuff. We get used to life. We get used to winning. We get used, sadly, we get used to losing. Well, Saul got used to winning. He'd surrounded himself with great warriors. He had a reputation for winning. He won against the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zobites, Philistines, Amalekites. Wherever he turned, the Scripture says he routed them. He had confidence. He had the strength that comes with wins. And then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, going into battle, another week, another enemy, should be another victory, all of a sudden, Goliath appears on the horizon. Anyone been there? You are motoring along in life. You had it all figured out. You knew the outcomes. You were very, very comfortable. You knew who you were and what you were doing and what you were about. And suddenly, some Goliath steps onto the horizon and your life changes in that moment. Because Saul, the winner, is now gripped with the very real possibility that he could lose it all. That's just life. We adapt to pressure. We get used to carrying a load. We cope. We learn. We win. And then Goliath. Cancer is a modern-day Goliath. Cancer changes everyone's life. When the doctor says cancer, in that moment... Everything in life will, will shift. It will, it will change. It's just the way it is. The body has proven itself to be incredibly resilient. The cancer patient sits there in, in, sh in utter shock and denial. They can't believe this is happening to them because their body has thrown off a thousand viruses and their body is mended when they've broken numerous bones. And the pills have worked. And they've been doing really well. And then all of a sudden, the doctor says, you have cancer and a giant lumbers onto the scene. And all of those old battles are forgotten and all of your history is cast aside and all of your, me all of your wins mean absolutely nothing. Nobody says, well, I got the flu and I beat the flu. I'll beat cancer. They're not 
even in the same zip code. There's a giant out there. And there's a giant out there for every one of us. But until you've taken one down, all you can see is his size. Maybe you're facing a giant, never seen anything quite like it before. Well, the Scripture says Goliath was unlike anything they'd seen before. He was, as best we measure, he was between 9 and 10 feet tall. He had at least 2 feet on Shaquille O'Neal. And the Scripture makes it clear because of the strength that he had in his body to carry the weight of the armor that he drug around. This was a man who was not just tall. This was a man who was massive. He was full dimensioned. He was pumped. He's a freak show. He's a nightmare. He's a widow maker. He's a killing machine. Saul had slain his thousands. Saul had beaten up regional armies. Saul had put Israel on the map as a military power. But Saul had never dealt, he'd never dealt with a Goliath. Never been down that road before. The armies of Israel, as they would fight in those days, one army would camp on one hill, the other army would camp on the other, and they would have a valley, sometimes a very broad valley, separating them, which would form basically a battlefield. And they would get themselves ready, they would prepare themselves, they'd put their sentries out to watch the other guys to make sure that no one was moving. And then they would wait for the fortuitous moment, and on one side or the other they would launch an attack. However, however... Battles were messy and they were costly. They were, they were bloody. And so the Philistines came up with an offer that was, this type of thing was well known in antiquity. Historically, it's, it's there in the record. Goliath steps out and he speaks for all of the Philistines. And he says, I'll fight for our side. Give us your best fighter from your side. Why? Do we have to shed all of this blood? One, one is going to die today, either me or him, but whoever dies, his side loses. Whoever wins, his side wins. Let's clean this up and make it efficient. And he issues the challenge, and Saul is left to answer, to find a man, to see if there's a champion among them Select one. It's efficient. It's clean. It's decisive. Well, Saul found out that one is too much if you haven't got one. Have you ever had people say, well, that's not a lot of money? It is if you don't have it. A buck is a lot if you don't have it. And Saul looked around and realized he was broke. He didn't have what he needed. The 17th chapter of 1 Samuel pre presents us with this 40-day stalemate, this standoff, standing on two hills. And Goliath comes out every day and he shouts over at the, the children of Israel and he insults them all and he says, send somebody down here and he threatens and he postures. And the Bible tells us, this is what's rather startling, the Bible tells us in verse 24 of that chapter that all the men of Israel would run away. So you kind of get the idea that the Philistines would kind of march out and form up and children of Israel would march out and form up and then Goliath would come out in front and say, okay, send your guy out and they'd all look at each other and then turn and run. The men of Israel were frightened. Saul was frightened. There was no one in the camp who wasn't frightened. Aside from all of that, they weren't just frightened. They were helpless and they were hopeless because they knew we do not have a man among us who can stand up to the giant. Into this standoff comes the youngest son of Jesse. He has three older brothers in arms who are there on the battlefield that day. He's there on an errand for his father. He's delivering food. But when he comes on the scene and he sees what's going on, he runs front and center. He wants, he wants to see what in the world is, is going on. What could be holding back the army of Israel? What could be thwarting the plan of God? What, what in the world is happening here? David is wondering. 
And Goliath comes out and shouts his insults and issues his challenge. And David sees what no one else sees. David sees that this is a God moment, not a Saul moment. It's a God moment. It's not an armor, spear, or javelin moment. It's a God moment. It's not an army moment. David looks at the whole mess. He sees the same thing everyone else sees, but he sees this is a God moment. This is a God-given opportunity. And aside from all of that, David recognizes with what Goliath is doing day in and day out, Goliath is insulting God. And so David feels even that secondary sense of God's got this in the bag. It's a courage moment. It takes courage to trust for the God moment, doesn't it? A lot easier just to stay on the sidelines. It's a lot easier just to run back into the tent. I'll come out and I'll check on it tomorrow. It's, 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 it's a lot easier to just put off really dealing with it. It's a courage moment, not a committee moment. It's about someone saying, God is able and I'm willing to be his instrument. It's an opportunity, not an obstacle, but no one else sees this except for David. David seems stunned that no one has stepped forward. And he asks, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Maybe you have the spirit of David. You're ready to engage. You trust the Lord. You aren't going to sit on the sidelines. Maybe you look at the story and say, I'm made of that kind of stuff. That's that's who I want to be. I I want to be a giant killer. I want to deal with the issues. I I want to be an overcomer. I want to be done with some of these things. Well, there's a few things you need to know. Quick tutorial this morning. Number one, know your enemy. Know your enemy. A lot of people never really engage their problems because they never really focus on the real problem. They'll focus on something else. They never get to the real issue. They never take on Goliath because they lose their focus. For David, that distraction came in the form of his older brother, Eliab. Eliab. Tall and handsome Eliab. The kid who had it so together that when Samuel saw him, he said, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. Eliab, the oldest, the lead brother, the alpha male. Eliab was a problem. Because Eliab didn't have the courage to go fight Goliath. Eliab wasn't leaving the camp. Eliab wasn't going to Saul saying, send me. Eliab was standing there with his brothers wondering what in the world they were going to do. And here comes little brother, and little brother opens his big trap and starts making a lot of sound and a lot of noise, and Eliab is embarrassed. You ever been embarrassed by your little brother? Little sister? Your your pastor, possibly. What a moment. Eliab's not only, Eliab is incensed. Verse 28, now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he says, why have you come down? Why have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David says, what have I done now? Well, isn't that a great response? Have you ever felt like that? What did I do? What have I done now? Was it not a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him as before. This could have easily turned into a family brawl. I got to tell you, this is one of the major disconnects in overcoming big problems in life. We get distracted, and rather than fighting Goliath, we are scrapping with our brothers and sisters. 
Rather than focusing on the problem, we get all caught up in some drama that is going on around us. Could have easily been the story with David and Eliab. David could have easily been drawn in. He could have, eleva he could have elevated the conflict. Let's replay this whole thing. Eliab says, I know all about you. You're presumptuous. You've come down here. You've just come down to see the battle. And David turns towards him and says, you're a coward. What happens next? Well, Big Brother's got to lay a whooping on it. Big Brother's got to defend his honor. David could have elevated this whole situation by just focusing his wrath, focusing his anger, focusing his attention on Eliab. But Eliab doesn't get much attention from David, and that's the lesson that we need to learn. David could have elevated this all by appealing to his brothers. I'm sure with eight brothers, I'm sure there was plenty of sibling rivalry. I'm sure David could have made the case with his brothers saying, can you believe Eliab? He's always talking down to us. He's always questioning our motivations. Tired of this guy. But we don't see any of that. David doesn't appeal to his brothers. David doesn't engage Eliab at all. As a matter of fact, David turns away. I wonder how much time we waste in life dealing with issues that are really not issues, troubling ourselves about things that really aren't things. Have you ever worried a lot about something that never came to pass, but that worry dominated your life for a season? Worries like that. Distraction. Well, that's what we see with David. Eliab could have been a huge distraction. If we could just learn this, Many a Goliath, many a problem goes unchallenged in life because we're fighting within the family. We should, bringing, bringing, we should be bringing down the giants. We're bringing down each other. We should be moving in the miraculous, but we're all caught up in little mini dramas. David turned away from Eliab. It it's, makes me mindful of the story of Nehemiah. You remember Nehemiah, his, his Goliath, his big, big task was rebuilding the broken down walls of Jerusalem. And so he goes and he gets the people organized and he wins a few successes. He wins a few of the skirmishes and the battles and the walls are going up. But he has an enemy and that enemy's name is Sanballat. And Sanballat launches just a continual stream of accusation against Nehemiah, threatening Nehemiah, saying, we're going to destroy the work that you're doing. And oh, by the way, I'm going to tell the great regional king about you and he's going to come in and stop the work you're doing and when Nehemiah just keeps building, Sanballat ultimately sends letters, publishes open letters saying Nehemiah is a scoundrel. Nehemiah is leading a rebellion. Nehemiah, he was trying to, in, he was trying to get the king to bring in an army and destroy the work that he, Nehemiah was doing. It was intimidating. And he asked Nehemiah, he said, I want you to come and meet with me. We need to have a little negotiation here. Sanballat obviously felt like he had got Nehemiah's attention. He felt like he, felt like he, was, he was dealing from a position of strength. And so he says, come meet with me on the plains of Ono. Oh no. Come meet with me on the plains of Ono. But Nehemiah sees through the whole, he sees through the whole scheme. He says, nothing like what you are saying is happening. Secondly, I cannot come down and meet with you because I'm doing a great work here. One of the great spiritual lessons of my life as a leader came from Nehemiah when I realized that people and circumstances and needs and all manner of satanic influence was at work against me in life to bring me down from the wall to get me to look away from the priority that God had established in my life so that I could do what he had called me to do and when I learned when I learned as painful as it was for me always wanting to be approved always wanting approval always wanting to perform when I realized that I as a leader had the responsibility from time to time saying I'm doing a great work here and I cannot come down it changed it changed the factors of my life 
It changed the dimension of my ministry. It will change yours too. When you don't focus on Eliab, but you focus on the enemy, when you look to the Lord and say, this boy is big, this is trouble, this is going to be difficult, but I know you are with me. My eyes are on you. I'm going to trust in you. My hope is going to be in you. My strength is going to be found in you, and I'm not going to be distracted. It's a moment, it's a moment where things will begin to fall into place as God leads you. David says to Eliab, what, what have I done? I'm just asking a question. And then the focus of the story, indeed, the focus of David turns completely back to Goliath again. And Eliab is suddenly irrelevant. Eliab doesn't appear in the story of David and Goliath anymore. Eliab doesn't appear at all. His appearance within the Scripture is only within the ranks of the army of Israel. It's cameo. He's gone. So many of the things that we give our attention to will be gone in 60 seconds, will be gone in 30 days, will be gone a year from now, while the important thing that has to be dealt with lingers out there on the horizon. No your enemy. Don't be distracted. Secondly, know yourself. Know yourself. When Saul heard that there was a man who was unafraid, he brings him in for an interview. And the first question he has for him, he asks it in a different way, but it comes down to this. Are you qualified? A lot of people get stuck right there. Are you qualified? None of us are qualified to kill giants. None of us. We're all faced with things that are bigger than we are. If they weren't bigger than we are, we would have dealt with them by now. They're bigger than we are, and so we haven't really approached them, and none of us can really deal with it. We don't know what to do. Are we qualified in and of ourselves? No. Are there any giants on your resume? I mean, Saul's a pragmatist here. He looks at, he looks at David, he looks across the valley at Goliath, and he makes a reasonable judgment. Here's David. There's Goliath. David's standing there in a shepherd's tunic. There's Goliath with all of his armor. David looks ordinary. Nice looking young man, but ordinary. The guy across on the hill there looks like an absolute monster. Goliath makes a reasonable judgment. He says, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. Saul knew, or, or David knew, that Saul was half right. David had never beaten a giant. He'd never wielded armor and sword. He wasn't raised for war. Saul was right. The giant killers don't let objections, even good ones, get in their way. David recounted that indeed he had not killed any giants, but he had killed a lion. He had killed a bear, and he says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You see, God prepares us for the big things with little things. If you are not faithful in the little things, if you don't take care of the things that you can take care of, if you haven't trusted God with lesser things, when Goliath comes on the scene, well, he's overwhelming. God entrusts us with little things. He puts us in challenging circumstances. He tests us. He tests all of us. And then he moves us on to, to greater things. But when Saul heard the, the courage of David, he witnessed the package. He saw this guy's resolve. He decided, well, this is the only shot I've got. And verse 38 is so interesting. He saw, he, and Saul clothed David in his armor, he put on a helmet of bronze. On his head, he clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't go with these, for I've not tested them. So David put them off. When it comes to killing giants, you need to be you, not someone you want to be. It's not about you pretending to be anything. 
If you want to kill giants, you've got to get real with yourself. You say, well, myself is rather unimpressive. That's exactly the kind of material that God works with when it comes to slaying giants. People who recognize, I can do nothing in my own strength, but I am willing to be used of the Lord. I'm willing to take the little bit that I have. I'm willing to take my nothing and give it absolutely to God that he might do something with it. When it comes to killing giants... God will help you if you will be you. Saul's armor was Saul's armor. It didn't fit David. Early in ministry, I struggled with Saul's armor. I come from a family of, of great preachers. Three uncles and my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather on both sides of the family. Many of them trailblazers. Many of them established works in places where nothing had been established before in Pentecostal circles. They, were, they, were, they did incredible things. My father and my uncle especially were known as orators. They were, they were men who could stand up and command an audience. They spoke to multiplied thousands of people on an ongoing basis. I grew up in the midst of, of all of that. Let me tell you, I struggled as a young man. I struggled as a young man because I wanted to strap on their armor. I wanted to do it like my uncle. I wanted to do it like my dad. I wanted to borrow a little bit of this and take a little bit of this. And, and when it's not really you, it doesn't really work. Oh, methodology might move you down the road a little bit. It might help you out a little bit. But when you're confronting a giant, armor that is not yours will not work. Fake it till you make it will not work. You'll just fake it and die. And there's, there have been a lot of preachers who've come along that I wish I, I wish I was this. I wish I was that. I wish I could do this. I wish I, I can't do those things. That's not who I am. The wonderful day of liberty that came to me as a young minister was recognizing God had called me to be me. And then, knowing that, he had called me into the ministry and he had committed to me this ministry, to me, not to my father, not to my uncle, not to my grandfather, not to anyone else. No one else's armor would fit. I had to learn to be comfortable with me. At home in my own skin. I think I'm still adjusting to that. For a long time, I felt like I had to be somebody else to please everybody else. What you see is what you get. You didn't like what I was projecting. When I tried to be what I wasn't, that didn't work. Anyone else found out that whatever you try and accomplish with an inauthentic spirit, or a soul that lacks that genuine connection with God, or a confidence that comes from knowing that you are moving within God's plan for you, it's a terrible place. It's a terrible thing in life to wish you were someone else. You can't live someone else's life. And in trying, in trying, you won't live their life, and you won't live your own. You'll fail twice. It's a terrible thing even to succeed on some le level, but to, to fail in being authentic. It's a terrible thing to get so caught up in shiny army that you forget all about the fight. Here's the kicker. Everything God needs to bring down Goliath is already in you. Everything He needs to bring down Goliath is already in you. You just have to surrender you. You just have to give you back to God. You just have to make you available. But everything you need is already there. Know your enemy. It's not your brother. It's a giant. Know yourself. It's not about somebody else's armor, strategy, persona, or gifting. David walked out of Saul's tent with nothing more than he had carried in. Crazy, isn't it? There's a 10-foot armored giant fighting machine, a predator, versus a shepherd in a tunic with a slingshot. 
But David knew his enemy. David knew himself. Three, know your source. Know your source. And this is the most important of all. Then David came to the Philistine and said, you come to me with, and he lists the armor here, a sword, a spear, and a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, who you have defied. And this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down and cut off your head and I'll give your dead bodies and the, and the bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God. Notice it's about God, 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 God. That there's a God in Israel and all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. David didn't hesitate. He ran. That's always stunned me in the scripture. David ran. I don't know about you. I put myself in that scenario and I reach a point of resignation. Okay. Got to go fight the giant. Time to go. Can't avoid this. I'm coming. I think I would. Um, I think I would maybe trudge. If my shoulders might be hunched over, I might be in deep concentration. But I don't know that I'd run. What it must have looked like to the armies encamped on both of the heights looking down and as Goliath is just lumbering down the slope, as Goliath is moving into position and from the other side they look and here comes this whacked out shepherd boy kid and he is running for all he is worth. He stops quickly at a brook tosses something into his pouch he's back on his feet again and he's running with everything he has he's closing the distance and because we know that he got the stones from the brook it's quite clear that David went more than halfway David's not only come across his his landscape he's not only come across his real estate he's now invaded the Philistines uh, uh, real estate and he's running straight towards him reaches into the bag for one of the stones that he picked up in the brook Wow. One stone against a human tank. Can you imagine what that moment was like? You hear that sound that would sound maybe like the, if you've ever heard an axe when it really gets the heart wood of a tree, bam! Or maybe the sound of a melon when you drop it on the floor. I don't know, but that stone right in the middle of the forehead. Can you see it in slow-mo? When I get to heaven, I want to see the replay. But for now, I just have to, but I can, I can imagine, I want to watch this one over and over and over again because I see the giant, and the giant's not moving fast, by the way. You got on that much armor and everything else, and, and you're kind of a killing machine, but it's kind of like, you know, so he's, he's lumbering along and he's moving towards David, but he's not, he's not running and all of a sudden, it's like a bee sting. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, bam! I'm looking for that pregnant moment in time where he kind of hangs between standing on his feet and falling on the ground. It's a roadrunner comedy hour type of thing where suddenly the land's all gone and, and the lights are out and Goliath still... I want to see that moment where in sudden sheer amazement. Goliath realizes that the tables have been completely turned. He sways to one side. He's off his feet. Now, if you take God out of the equation, then David got lucky. When you read the Scripture, you'll say that David got help. It wasn't luck. It was the Lord. For our sakes, for our sakes, God has developed a guided missile program. 
for every giant in every life, there's a stone. There's a stone. God has, by His own power, caused water to flow down through a little valley, and that water has been washing over, it's been washing over the stones of that brook for years and years and years and years every day people come by the brook they look at the brook and they say all I see is a brook all I see is water flowing I just see a place where animals come and drink no one has any idea whatsoever that what God is doing with the water washing over the rock is he is shaping the perfect stone And when David reaches into his bag, he picked up five of them. When he reaches into his bag, he pulls out the stone, and it's just right. He begins to swing it, and as he releases the slingshot, one of God's guided missiles finds its place, it finds its mark, and the giant must come down. Listen, all of this has been happening, and you were completely unaware of it. You had no idea. You had no idea that God had already crafted and already designed what is necessary to defeat the adversaries in your life. What He needs from you, what He needs from me, is a surrendered, willing, courageous heart that says, Lord, you've designed just what I need. I'm saying to somebody today, it's not hopeless. It's not over. This isn't the last chapter. It's not always, it doesn't have to always be this way. Giants, come down. And it probably won't be conventional And it's not the way you thought that you would have defeated that. But if you'll honor Him and trust Him, if you'll engage, He'll give you strength. He'll give you power. He'll give you the resource. He'll give you the means. He'll give you the strategy. He'll give you the moment. He'll give you the speed. He'll give you everything you need. Because the end of the story of David and Goliath isn't about a giant and a shepherd boy. The end of the story is the glory of God. How many of you would pray with me, Lord, I want you to be glorified in my life. I want to see the giants fall.